on you. Uh, sorry about the smell this morning. We had uh, roofers come that we weren't expecting. And, uh, so uh, sorry about that here in the sanctuary. We'll be following the Printer River Worship. The only hymn we're singing is 447. You'll see in your worship folder there uh, which verses that we will be singing. Also after the homily, we have another solo uh, after the homily today. Thank you.
19. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for this place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. A reading from Luke 23. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they had come to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise.
Jesus died so we might live. Amen. We have three texts for our little homily today. First from Matthew 26, Jesus said to him, Why have you come to me? Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Luke 23, 22, a third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. Matthew 27, 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When a child reaches a certain age, almost any order is answered with the question, why? Why come in out of the rain and you'll get wet? Why? getting dark, time to go to bed. Why? No answer satisfies. Three why questions appear in the passion of our Lord, none of which is answered. Jesus asked Judas, why? Friend, why have you come? The second question is Pilate to the leaders of the people, why? What crime has this man committed? Jesus asks the third question as he hangs on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can this be God forsaken by God? It is impossible to permeate the divine mystery and workings of the Holy Trinity. Earlier in his ministry, our Lord said of his Father, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Could Jesus make that claim now? Peter must have felt very alone when he denied our Lord three times. Who has not known loneliness when caught sinning? But the greatest loneliness of all was when the Father made his Son to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We each have different weaknesses, don't we? Many of which surface during our Lenten times, pride, envy, greed, just to name a few. Christians are not exempt from the sins of the heart and the flesh. When we experience difficulties, we may wonder, God has heard our pleas that we pray in the Lord's Prayer to deliver us from evil. The writer to the Hebrews directs us this way, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Luther even closes his explanation in the Catechism by saying that when our last hour comes, our Father would give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. You know, the Bible often pictured eternal life with our Lord in negative terms, no hunger, no thirst, no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. But when our forefathers came to America, think about this. They were separated from loved ones for the rest of their lives. With the ease of travel and the communications we have today, the problem is not so large. But there are still heart-rendering separations, and death is one of these. We can make new friends, but those who have left Earth are never replaced. This touches on the age-old question, 
Will we know each other in heaven? The Holy Spirit doesn't tell us. But if you insist, how else can we explain that at the transfiguration of our Lord, Peter recognized Moses and Elijah, who appeared with Jesus, although they died centuries ago. And if we press for a few more details, we need to remember that anything we understand now would be too little to fit the heavenly scene. Also, what pleases us now may not please us in the next world. So today on Good Friday, isn't it enough to trust our Lord? He plainly tells us this, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. A good friend invites you to his home, which we've never seen. We wouldn't demand information about the room we would use, what the menu would be, or who else was invited. We would show confidence in the host by accepting the invitation with thanks. And not only that, we would anticipate with joy whatever he prepared for us. His death today reassures us we have a place prepared in heaven for each of us. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
We'll now sing verses 19 and 21 of our hymn, then we'll have our closing scripture. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.